when you're by the sea, what is it makes you feel so fine? It's the air, I tell you, it's the air. There's also in the oxygen and bovril in the brine. You talk about your dumbbells and your best port wine. Your heart begins to palpitate, your nose begins to shine. You feel your lungs expanding as you wander by the shore. Blackpool. The first seaside resort to set its stall out for the industrial working class. The first, and also the biggest, by a very long way. Its popularity and reputation were made in the later 19th century, when specific social and economic factors combined to bring it into the working class market, when other resorts around Britain's coast remained essentially genteel and middle class. What is left of Victorian Blackpool today has been transformed and embellished by successive generations of businessmen. But Blackpool, in its own way, remains a Victorian town, as this rare archive footage shows. Its business? Pleasure. Mass-produced pleasure for the workers in the factories, foundries and mines of Northern and Midland England. But at the beginning of the 19th century, Blackpool was only a small, rather remote seaside resort for the middle classes. Lawyers and cotton manufacturers from Bolton, Blackburn or Halifax the Blackpool of the 1830s and early 1840s gives few hints at what was to follow. A scattering of houses along the seafront, but nothing as substantial or refined as Scarborough or Brighton. The main attractions were the sea and the firm expanse of sand. Above all, Blackpool was a health resort. Sea bathing and seawater drinking were the main attractions. The visitors were respectable enough, although the cream of Lancashire society went to Harrogate or Scarborough. At the beginning of the century, these unpretentious visitors, seeking this ancient cure-all, mixed easily enough with those better-off visitors who were themselves fairly rough and ready in their manners. This all changed with the arrival of the first railway in 1846. Talbot Road Station brought what was still a Lancashire village into contact with the great industrial areas of Yorkshire and the Midlands. In 45 years, Blackpool was to grow into a town with over one and a half million visitors a year. As Blackpool developed, it had to adjust to the volume of visitors that emerged from the station and passed down this central route through the town, which led straight to the seafront. The land was owned by a nearby gentry family, the Cliftons of Lytham. In the 1840s, they drew up plans to develop this central area into detached and semi-detached villas with large gardens and gravel drives. But soon after the railway arrived, they changed their minds realising what hordes of trippers surging past the garden gates every weekend would do for potential purchasers. Instead of imposing their smart villa estate on the centre of Blackpool, the Cliftons leased plots of land to individual developers, who cheerfully put up four times as many houses in the same space. This preference for a quick, secure profit, rather than a planned upmarket development, set a precedent over most of Blackpool in subsequent years. The result was cheerfully cramped, but without any of the privacy valued by the middle classes. Added to this, set-paved streets made it uniquely noisy for a holiday resort. All this contrasted greatly with the sedately planned villas of nearby Lytham, 
put up by the Clifton family to attract the well-to-do in Lancashire society. Other resorts around the country, like Rill in North Wales, were also being developed to meet the expectations of the prospering mid-Victorian middle classes. Scarborough, itself the pinnacle of respectability among northern resorts, was being developed in precisely the right tone to maintain its position with the social elite and industrial millionaires. By contrast, Blackpool's central development made it difficult to compete in this expanding middle-class holiday market. But it did at least acquire a familiar and unpretentious atmosphere which did not intimidate working-class visitors. But some of Blackpool was designed purposely to be upmarket. In 1863, the seafront north of the existing built-up area, known as Claremont Park, fell into the hands of the Blackpool Land Building and Hotel Company. This Manchester-dominated consortium aimed to build substantial cliff-top terraces for prosperous residents and summer visitors. Lansdowne Crescent, for all its grandeur, is the only Victorian crescent in Blackpool. The whole area was kept quiet and select by a toll of one penny, which was charged to all non-residents wanting to pass along the seafront. Pubs, stalls and open-air amusements were forbidden. The Imperial Hotel, part of this development, was from the beginning the town's most expensive and prestigious hostelry. Still known as Claremont Park, this development was vital to Blackpool's mid-Victorian economy. Although much altered, it retains its reputation for being the posh end of town. When it was built, it provided a refuge for the better class families who were still the most reliable and best-paying visiting public for an aspiring resort. When the town's first pier was built in 1863, it was also intended as a select promenade over the waves for these better-class visitors. A tuppenny charge was levied to keep the lower orders at bay. Opening in May 1863, it was an immediate success. So much so, that not even the Tuppany Toll deterred the swarms of excursionists. On summer weekends, it became so crowded and socially mixed that plans were quickly made for a second pier to the south. This second pier was intended to siphon off the lower class excursionists leaving the North Pier to maintain its social respectability. The second pier, or Central Pier as it's now named, was soon referred to as the People's Pier. Within a decade of its opening, it was drawing in over half a million customers annually. As such, it was the first big entertainment scheme in Blackpool or any other resort to aim explicitly at working class custom. Unsqueamish about advertising, the peer company augmented its income without upsetting the sensibilities of its customers. The owner of this hotel, a popular pub called the Wellington, gave the site for the peer entrance to the company that built it. The vast volume of extra custom he benefited from proved ample payment in the end. Access to the central pier cost only a penny and provided the opportunity of cheap steamer trips to the Isle of Man and nearby resorts. 
but above all, it offered open-air dancing. Nothing elegant or refined, a simple brass band rather than an orchestra, a good strong rhythm that reflected the holiday mood. This informal outdoor dancing made the pier's fortune. By the 1870s, the central pier was as irredeemably brash as the North Pier was snobbishly refined. The railways, once again, played a decisive part. A second station, Central Station, was opened. Although it has now been pulled down, it was only a couple of hundred yards from the entrance to the Central Pier. Ever widening streams of trippers began to flow along this stretch of promenade between Central Station and Central Pier. A terrace of respectable boarding houses with long front gardens lined the promenade. During the 1880s, more and more of the householders gave way to the temptation to put up various stalls in front of their houses to cater for these excursionists. <laughs> Today, it is one of the most celebrated attractions in Blackpool's popular image. Boisterous and noisy, the Golden Mile will take away your money and offer to amuse you in the same way as it always has. Fortune tellers remain, but bingo, slot machines and mechanical laughter replace the ventriloquists shooting galleries and oyster stalls of the late 19th century. Back in the 1870s, as Blackpool's popularity grew with astonishing speed, it attracted huge new speculative investments and entertainment, including this, the Royal Palace Gardens, Rakes Hall. This was set up on a 51-acre site, half a mile inland from the sea, it consisted of a conservatory set in botanical gardens offering respectable and improving recreations attractive to the leisured classes. But it soon became clear that they were the worst paying portions of the grounds. The visitors that turned up sought excitement rather than enlightenment. And once again, it was the open air dancing that really drew the crowds. As well as the displays of spectacular fireworks. Pickpockets and prostitutes multiplied, causing controversy with Blackpool's civic leaders. And the whole enterprise took on a certain cheerful notoriety that contradicted the high flown notions of improvement with which it was founded. Another speculative venture, back in the town centre, which was also obliged to respond to popular working class demands, was the Winter Gardens. Unlike Rakes Hall, it still exists today. Opened in 1878, it was supposed to provide a select indoor heated promenade with a display of exotic plants as a setting for formal concerts attractive to the refinements of the middle class. It was hoped that this might encourage the development of a winter season. But on Blackpool's exposed and blustery northern coastline, this was a hope born to die. The sixpenny entrance fee proved no deterrent to working class excursionists who would voice their disapproval when the music was not to their taste. The management soon realised that music hall entertainment was needed to make the Winter Gardens profitable. After a female human cannonball was featured at Whitsuntide 1879, the entertainments offered became steadily less and less refined. The seafront, however, continued to prosper 
with its social segregation. While the central pier augmented its resources with uninhibited advertising, the north pier was embellished with stylish new refreshment rooms. The Indian Pavilion was the great delight of the decade. A fantasy of oriental architecture, which in the popular imagination of the time had become synonymous with entertainment. The pier had its own orchestra, to whose concerts a shilling admission was charged, and no concessions to music hall or popular variety were offered. The social high point for the North Pier, however, came on the Sunday morning after-service church parade, when the middle-class visitors competed to display the complexities of their hats and the bindings of their prayer books. Meanwhile, down on the Central Pier, the irksome trippers danced their feet off in ever-growing numbers. These houses, near the old central station, are particularly remarkable. The working class visitors, laden with tin trunks and brown paper parcels, could practically fall off the train into these hospitable front doors. The houses were built as high and deep as could be afforded. Extensions, upwards and backwards, have continued over the years with the local authority turning a blind eye on building bylaws to allow the maximum number of visitors to be crammed in. If private profit was put before public health, the Victorian visitors could not afford better. Outwardly, the streets have a reassuring familiarity with the working class terraces of the cotton towns. But writ large and coloured up to remind people they were on holiday. The question of local government ignoring public health standards in the boarding houses contrast with its intervention along the seafront. The new promenade, so essential to Blackpool's growth, was created by the local Board of Health. But the private company which started the promenade tramway, a pioneer in the use of electricity, failed to invest in the appropriate new technology. And when its trams broke down, they had to be pulled by horses. Eventually, Blackpool's corporation stepped in and took on the responsibility for the tram service, which continues today. In this decade, Blackpool's famous tower was built. But despite Blackpool's fairground atmosphere, it has never been solely a working class resort. It could never afford to frighten away those middle class families on whom its early prosperity had been based. It was thus very important that the different social and cultural groupings among the visitors should be kept apart. Important because of the extent to which mid and late Victorian England was riven by snobberies, hypocrisies and class divisions. A purely working class resort was unlikely to thrive, even in prosperous Lancashire. Its customers were still too vulnerable to trade depression, unemployment and wage cuts. Blackpool was unique in both the range and scale of its entertainments. But above all, it was the sea which remained its distinctive attraction.
High seas at Blackpool was sufficient information to have the trains packed with day trippers. If sea bathing had been a cure-all at the start of the century, it had now been replaced with sea air. But like today, pursuit of amusement came first.